Good morning, Centennial. Welcome to worship. Won't you please sing with us? i 
sinners come find his mercy come to the table he will satisfy taste of his goodness find what you're looking for Was fair. 
welcome to worship. I'm so glad to welcome each and every one of you, no matter where you are, whether in your pajamas, sitting on the couch, whether you're eating breakfast, whether this is in the middle of the night on a Tuesday, I am glad to welcome you to worship, friends. It is good to be a part of something bigger than ourselves in a time when we feel so isolated and we're kept so far apart from each other. So I'm glad to be here with each and every one of you. Please take this moment to fill out our Connect card. We'll show a QR code that will take you to that page and I'll be sure to throw a link into the chat box if you're watching live on Sunday morning. Our connect card is our way to stay in connection with you so that we can know just who's watching and how you're doing and you can let us know how we can connect with you and pray for you. So please take a moment to fill that out friends. Since the beginning of fall, we have been looking at our scripture stories, starting all the way in the beginning with Genesis. We walked through the story of Adam and Eve, the story of Abraham and Sarah, the story of Joseph, and last week we started the story of Moses and the great deliverance of all of the Hebrew slaves out of Egypt. Moses was a Hebrew man who was raised in Egypt in the household of one of the servants of Pharaoh. He ended up fleeing after he murdered one of the slave masters, after he witnessed the slave master beating a slave, a Hebrew slave. Moses flees all the way to the countryside of Midian, where he meets his wife, where he meets his future father-in-law, and he works as a shepherd. And one day as he is out tending his flock, a burning bush with the voice of God calls out to him and calls him to go back to Egypt to set all 600,000 slaves and their families free to deliver them out of Egypt to a land that God has promised. Well, friends, this is a really big ask. And so many of us are familiar with this story about how Moses goes back with his family and all the people who are going to help him. And he tries to tell Pharaoh to let his people go. But Pharaoh is stubborn. And God ends up sending all of these plagues to try to convince and to move Pharaoh's heart to let all of these Israelites, let all the Hebrew people go. Finally, after the ninth plague, the Hebrew people are let out of Egypt and into the wilderness, friends. They spend 40 years wandering through the Middle Eastern wilderness, waiting for God to call them and bring them to this promised land. So last week, we talked all about what they did in preparation for this time in the wilderness. And one of the first things God establishes in this community through Moses is the practice of Passover, knowing that these people were going to need reminders of just where they had been and where they were going, reminders of what God has done for them, what God has delivered them from, and the promise that God has for them, the promise of liberation, the promise of new land, the promise of hope. So last week we talked all about the importance of that Passover meal and then celebrated communion with each other. We also have that sort of routine celebration, that routine reminder that God loves us, that God forgives us, and there is hope and grace always. And we are reminded of that as we freely receive the bread and freely receive the cup. Well, friends, we're jumping right back into the story of Moses and those over half a million people wandering through the desert, wandering through the desert, looking to Moses for leadership, looking to God for leadership. So God has delivered them across the Red Sea. God has provided food and water, a manna and quail for all of the people of Israel to eat. God is with them as they come into conflict with the Amalek people, where a military leader named Joshua goes in. And as long as Moses stands watching with his arms raised, the Israelite people are victorious. He needs help eventually holding his arms up. But God makes sure and is there and makes it possible for these folks to survive, to make it through. And this entire time, God is appearing as either a, a cloud of smoke that is leading them in the daytime or a pillar of fire that is leading them in the nighttime. God's voice sounds like thunder to almost everyone except Moses. And even with all of that, friends, it is still hard for these Israelite people, for these Hebrew people. There are over 600,000 of them. The scripture says 600,000 men and children. Not sure where the woman count is, but over 600,000 people are in the wilderness. 
They are anxious and they are complaining about their experience. They are already so afraid of what else they could be facing in this journey that they're talking about wanting to go back to Egypt. At least they knew what to expect there. And friends, at this point in scripture, it is worth noting that it has been less than a year in what we now know is their 40-year journey in the wilderness. And they want to know how in the world they are going to make it. It has been less than a year and it already feels like things are falling apart. So this leader, Moses, has his work cut out for him. There is no question. And Moses spends, rightly so, I think, a long and a lot of time communing with God and speaking with God and seeking wisdom and leadership and direction from God. And so at this point in the story where we're going to be jumping back into our scripture, Moses has led the Hebrew people through the peninsula of Sinai all the way into the land of Midian to Mount Sinai. This is a mountain that that is notable, that is famous in scripture for where God communes with God's people, where God spoke directly to Moses. So Moses ends up taking some time to go up the mountain. He says, peace, I'll see you later, Israelites. I'm headed up the mountain to have a good long chat with God. And so Moses goes up Mount Sinai and spends 40 days and 40 nights communing with God. And that's the Bible's way of saying a very, very long time. And while Moses is up atop Mount Sinai, God has quite a bit to say about how we are going to make it through this, about how God is going to be especially present with the Israel people, or with the Israelite people, with the Hebrew people as we are in the wilderness. Amen. God goes on and on and talks about the Ten Commandments. There is going to be a rule and a way and a covenant, a way of being together where we are staying in love with God and being responsible and accountable to one another. We are staying in good relationship with each other. God goes on to talk about what worship is going to be like as they travel through the wilderness, about building altars while they're on the road, about building a tabernacle and a tent where God can especially dwell and be present among the Hebrew people. Now, these instructions are super specific, but they lead us to believe that God has every intention to stay right here with the Hebrew people. God isn't going anywhere. God will lead these people through this time of wilderness. Now, while all of this is happening up at the top of the mountain, there is a lot going on at the foot of the mountain. This is where we are going to be jumping back into our scripture. We're going to be going to Exodus chapter 32, verses 1 through 14. And remember, this is the great meanwhile down at the foot of the mountain. So let's read together. The people saw that Moses was taking a long time to come down from the mountain. They gathered around Aaron and said to him, Come on, make us gods who can lead us. As for this man Moses who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't have a clue what has happened to him. Aaron said to them, All right, take out the gold rings from the ears of your wives, your sons and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took out the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. He collected them and tied them up in a cloth. Then he made a metal image of a bull calf, and the people declared, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf. Then Aaron announced, Tomorrow will be a festival to the Lord. They got up early the next day and offered up entirely burnt offerings and brought well-being sacrifices. The people sat down to eat and drink and then got up to celebrate. The Lord spoke to Moses, hurry up and go down. Your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt are ruining everything. They've already abandoned the path that I commanded. They have made a metal bull calf for themselves. They've bowed down to it and offered sacrifices to it and declared, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I've been watching these people and I've seen how stubborn they are. Now leave me alone. Let my fury burn and devour them. Then I'll make a great nation out of you. But Moses pleaded with the Lord his God. 
Lord, why does your fury burn against your own people, whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt with great power and amazing force? Why should the Egyptians say he had an evil plan to take the people out and kill them in the mountains and so wipe them off the earth? Calm down your fierce anger. Change your mind about doing terrible things to your own people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants whom you yourself promised. I'll make your descendants as many as the stars in the sky. And I've promised to give your descendants this whole land to possess for all time. Then the Lord changed his mind about the terrible things he said he would do to his people. This is a pretty incredible story. Amen. This is a story where we, the tables seem to be turned a little bit. We actually get to see Moses kind of talk God down off the ledge, right? To, to talk God out of just destroying everything and for wiping everyone out. The first thing Moses does is remind God that, hey, these aren't my people. These are your people, your chosen children, friends. So you ain't going to put that back on me. And then Moses says, hey, why in the world did you even deliver them out of Egypt? You've already invested all of this time, all of this energy, all of this hope, right? You already brought them this far. Why would you give up now? Was it all for nothing? And then Moses reminds God of the covenant that God has made with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Israel, with Jacob, and now these tribes of Israel that are marching through the wilderness, you've made your people a promise, and you are our faithful God. You keep your promises. It's interesting that Moses is the one now trying to keep things together, right? After everything seems to be falling apart. And first it was all, you know, for the last six months, for the last um, so many months, it has been all about the anxiety and fear of all of these Israelites that was threatening to mess everything up. And now Moses has to worry about God, about God's own anger and all the things that God could do with this anger. So I have a confession to make that this particular passage in the Bible has always made me a little uncomfortable. A little uncomfortable um, just because of the way that the tables are turned, right? I am uncomfortable with the fact that it seems like Moses is the one teaching and leading God, like Moses is the one in control. When I have been taught and hold true that God is always the one that acts first, that loves first, that teaches and guides us, amen? Because I find that biblical heroes, the human ones anyway, are not always right, the most dependable of celebrities, not always the most um, dependable of characters. Amen. I mean, David, yes, King David, he slayed Goliath, but he also sent a good man off to die so that he could marry that guy's wife, right? We see Noah. Noah was known as this upstanding man that, that God saw and had favor for. And yet we see Noah fall into a depression and alcoholism that ends up kind of dissolving his family unit. And here we're about to see Moses actually come down this mountain and then order a group of people to just kind of start to slaughter each other. I am often uncomfortable turning to the human characters in scripture. I am very used to looking at God. How is God guiding us and leading us? And as uncomfortable as I am to kind of see God so out of control of God's self, there is something about that that I can definitely relate to. Amen? And I wonder if you can too. Because there is plenty to be angry about in the world right now. Amen? There's plenty to be angry about. Angry that we are at the mercy of a virus that has basically changed everything about our lives making them nearly unrecognizable. I have a lot of anger about the pervasiveness and overwhelming reality of systemic racism that has been around for centuries. And you know, hey, it's an election year, so tis the season to be angry at everyone. And it's worth noting that anger is a natural emotion and can be a helpful one, right? It helps tell us when when something is wrong, when we have been wronged, where, where we see something unjust, unjust, amen? Anger can be a helpful emotion. 
but anger can also bloom and overwhelm and overcome. Amen. Anger can spread like wildfire when it starts to be the only thing speaking for our hurts and for our powerlessness if it goes unprocessed, right? And God shows us this. God shows us that anger is uncomfortable and anger is difficult and anger can be overwhelming. But the other thing we see God show us in this passage is anger is something that can be processed in community. There is a reason that we might be angry in this particular season, amen? When we are stuck in that unknown place, in that powerless place, and we don't know how long we're gonna be stuck here, you know, we have reasons to be angry. God had reasons to be angry and frustrated with the Israelites. Moses has reason to be angry and frustrated with the community around him. Heck, those Israelites had reason to be angry. And that anger does flare up, friends. And we will experience anger as a part of our journey through this unknown time, through this wilderness. But what will we do with it? And how does God show us how to process that anger? What good news can we pull out of this scripture? The first thing that moves God's heart as Moses speaks is a reminder that, hey, these aren't Moses' people. These are God's people. We are God's people. We are not in this season alone. We have each other. We have our neighbors. We have our communities. And we have God. The next thing that moved God's heart that Moses talked about is why in the world would you bring these people this far and then leave them in the middle of it? Maybe this scripture can assure us that God has brought us this far and has no intention of not bringing us the rest of the way, friends. Think of all that we have accomplished, all the things that we have gotten through, all of the hardships that we have already faced, and all the ways that God was there and continues to be there for us. We are not in this alone, and God has no intention of leaving us high and dry in the middle of the wilderness. And the last thing Moses urges of God is to remember that God keeps God's promises. We can remember that no matter the hardship, no matter the anger, no matter the pain, friends, God is faithful and God keeps God's promises. And God has promised us forgiveness and grace and hope. God has promised us to especially be with us when things are difficult, when things are hard. Friends, this is a season where we all feel like we are walking on a tightrope and we are one step away from falling into the despair and the anger that is just going to drown us. There are going to be times and perhaps have been times where we just want to give up, to start over, to burn it all down. But God knows how to help us through that because God has been there. And that is reassuring to me and reaffirms that message in scripture over and over and over again, that our God does know us and see us, that our God loves us and is present alongside us. God knows our struggles, God knows our hearts, and God isn't going anywhere. God will continue to lead us through this time of wilderness, through these seasons of anger and pain. This is not an easy journey. This has not been an easy journey. But it is one that we are on with God. And for that, I'm thankful. For that, we'll say thanks be to God. Amen.
Friends, and now is our time of offering. And I would truly ask for you to pray and consider what you can give to the ministries of Centennial United Methodist Church. This has been a hard season for us all. And if you have the ability and opportunity and the gifts to offer, I would invite you to do so. We will show a QR code that will take you to our giving page. You can also find that giving page at our website, centennialumc.org. And I will also throw a link in the chat box if you're watching live on Sunday. Let us give and let us give joyfully. Praise for
now, friends, may we go together to take one more step into the unknown, one more step into this and on this wilderness journey. May we go from this place into all the moments to come knowing the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the peace and power and guidance and forgiveness of the Holy Spirit is with us, is with you, is with me. Let us go from this place to continue this journey, seeking hope, seeking deliverance, and trusting in our God. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Amen.